Um, new hardware from Cisco. Of course, what makes this kind of unique is we're going into it with an XOR radio in the 2.4 gigahertz slots, which those of you who know me and my fondness for the 2.4 gigahertz portion of the <laughs> spectrum will understand this is sort of like a lifelong dream come true here. So I've got really high expectations for it. Um, Things that are brand new innovations, zero impact AVC, running it on the APs, uh, horsepower, multi-gigabit uplinks, I'm going to stay away from that. Where's Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> Smart antenna connector. Um, we had this concept probably five or six years ago, you know, where we should be able to just plug the antenna into the AP, and the AP knows what the gain is and what the profile is and passes that on. Um, of course, that requires hardware in the AP as well. Uh, flexible radio assignment. This is the part I'm going to talk about today is FRA. Um, it's one thing to have hardware, using it intelligently. Um, you know, you guys have been on sites where you've got six or eight thousand APs deployed across campuses. It gets really hard to spot a needle in that haystack, doesn't it? So, all the assistance we can get. 802.11 AC Wave 2 MU MIMO. That I've got high expectations for too, although starting to do some math on this. Um, MU MIMO is a great boon and probably most people won't ever see it, but there's a suggestion the more users you pop into an MU MIMO cell, the worse the performance gets and you eventually overrun it with management. But uh, I don't know. You know how that goes. We'll all find out where that line is about the time the second bus load gets there, right? Mm. <laughs> um, Wave 2 AP portfolio, this of course replaces the top end 2 and 3 tiers. Uh, 1850 and 1830 is the way the new prime or the new lineup runs. 2800, 3800i. Um, we're doing I's, E's, and a P model. Uh, obviously, the P model is something that I am looking forward to. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about this over in uh, Barcelona. I do Mobile World Congress every year. And we're starting to get to the point where we're overrunning some of the cells they had in there with 3,700. So this looks to be a real good replacement. Uh, we'll talk about how that works. Mechanicals, I won't bore you. Wait, that one's important. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have 28 watts, you will not get any LEDs on this AP. <laughs> So it definitely requires 802.3 AT power. So is that how you the turn off the LEDs? Huh? Is that how you turn off the LEDs when the customers want them off? Yeah, we just trim it back to 27 watts and everything just, yeah. But see, the LED and the, the actual signal are linked. <laughs> yeah, no glow, no go. <laughs> we still have the command for shutting off the LED separately. So it does require some power. Um, the 3800, not the 2800. 3800, yeah, 2800. Uh, there's there's a little more there's a little more wiggle room on, but put 30 watts on there. Otherwise, you'll find. And I did at home. I thought I had it coming out of every switch I had, and I found one that was not going to get there. So even the 2800, if you run it under AF, what you will you lose spatial streams? Will you? Uh, does it? What, right now, what? the guidance that I've been given to give, um, and I haven't I haven't actually touched the 2800 yet. <laughs> They're, uh, they're not growing them on trees as fast as we normally do. <laughs> I touched it. Did you? I haven't turned it on yet. Really? Right <laughs> Good. Well, I feel better now. <laughs> um, yeah, 2800, the guidance we're given, is it, you got to have AT power. There's not going to be any performance degradation on it. Um, it's, it's a lot going on in there. Okay. And this so is there's really... No, there's no specific saying, if you run it under AF, this is what you'll get. There is it, no, there is no table saying, like you're used to saying you will AT. get two spatial streams. There's no scaling back gotcha. on this. It's okay. on or off. Okay. Yeah. All right. Flexible radio architecture. Um, some of you have, have touched this. Some of you have seen it. Some of you have been participants in some of the beta program um, that's currently going on. And that's what we've been working on lately. Um, XOR radios, not new. Uh, around here, everybody's like, well, you know, what's with this XOR radio? We've been doing XOR radios for quite some time. But that's specifically 2.4 and 5 gigahertz in the same silicon, right? And we've had them in WISM modules, WYSI modules, um, the new uh, location modules coming in. So there's been a lot of hardware experience with this thus far. Uh, putting it in as slot zero on a 2.45 gigahertz radio, yay, I just applaud that one. 
You guys deploy a few networks out here, so you, you get the challenge. Macro micro or micro macro, that's not a new concept either. This is something that's been around for a long time. It's a cell within a cell, right? And the idea is to enhance the sweet spot. Well, the challenge that you have today is your channels have to be separated, right? If you're going to do a cell within a cell, you've got to have good separation on that. But it's very, very possible to create a sweet spot under that AP where we're targeting MCS8, MCS9, potentially clients. And if you keep those clients in that sweet spot, and everybody who can't do that, because we all live in mixed environments, you push them out to the macro cell, you just freed up all the airtime for the MCS 8 and 9 clients to just go nuts. So it's really about splitting out the airtime or putting the most efficient approach to the client together. Now, a couple of things on that. First off, we've got to identify what roles we're going to use our radios in. And I'll get back to macro micro in, in just a minute. The 2.4 gigahertz or slot zero, the, the traditional 2.4 gigahertz interface, all these APs come up as a 2.4 and a 5 gigahertz interface, right? The next thing that happens is we've developed an algorithm to actually check, it's called the, the coverage overlap factor. So basically we measure every single AP and all of its neighbor APs and we're looking for what percentage of that AP cell can be covered by other surrounding APs already in the infrastructure at the power they're at. So we do an evaluation. If I get 90, 95, 100% coverage factor, that's obviously a redundant 2.4 gigahertz interface. Now the algorithm's extremely conservative, which is my preference. Um, you start getting APs that are showing 75% covered. In fact, when I first brought it up, I threw two APs on a table two meters apart, brought them up, and they both came up and said 53% covered. That was the first bug we fixed. <laughs> that was being ultra conservative, and I said, I'm all for ultra conservative, but that seems a little conservative to me. And they were like, we never actually tested it with two APs close together. And I thought, I would think everybody would. I mean, it's the first thing I'm going to do is put it on the table. And the problem with that was they were actually too close together, right? So there's some conservativeness built into it. What I've, what I've looked at, and we've been doing quite a bit of testing with it, and I've got Wes Purvis up here this morning with me. Wes, some of you know, has a lab out in Ohio. I just spent a week with Les out, or Wes out there uh, playing AP games. <laughs> but we set up pretty much, we've got the space out there to set up a normal you know, enterprise deployment. I stuffed four APs in the big room, and the first time we brought it up, one of them showed 98% overlap. The other one came in like 78% overlap. We reset this and ran it several times, right? Um, it all works off of neighbor messaging, and, and I'll get into that here in a minute. But I'm seeing the algorithm giving me very, very good input. If I've got a radio that's covered at 76% and that radio is up against the wall, I only need 50% of that radio's cell, so I can go out and make an evaluation on it. So sensitivity is set pretty high right now, keeping in mind to keep it conservative. Why are we doing this? Because you got too much 2.4 gigahertz out there. I've got one-seventh the channels. I've got approximately a good rule of thumb, one and a half times the, the, the coverage with 2.4 as I do in 5 gigahertz. If I put in a high-density 5 gigahertz network, I got too many 2.4 gigahertz radios. So redundant radio identification, part of FRA, is the first thing we do. Now Cisco, you guys all know about neighbor uh, discovery protocol. Every single AP sends neighbor messages out, and this is a broadcast message, only Cisco APs here. So I have the RF diff distance of every AP versus every other AP. And it's centralized on the controller, so I can actually analyze that in all the NDP messages. I can build an X and Y coordinate for the APs, and then I can plot the coverage around the APs given their current power level. And once I've done that, we can go back and we can take a multi-point analysis of each one of those AP cells. So that's how we develop the cost overlap factor. But it starts with the NDP messaging. Obviously, if NDP is broke, and you guys, I don't want to keep being disparaging on 2.4 gigahertz because I think it's an awesome IoT band. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But if you're serious about connecting and communicating, 2.4 <laughs> is probably not your best bet if you're going to do anything with neighbors nearby or anything else. So 
I'm really happy with what I'm seeing. I'm really happy with the cost overlap factor. Now, if I'm an administrator, do I just turn RRM on and auto and, and you know, maybe someday I will say that, but I'm kind of a realist. <laughs> Particularly, well, here's one good rule. Never do anything new Friday at 5 p.m., right? <laughs> Not unless you didn't have plans for the weekend and you were looking to fill that out. So we're going to develop the cost overlap factor. This is going to give me a way to go in and evaluate against real deployments. And, and why am I concerned about that? Well, let's go back to this slide right here. I don't know about walls. I don't know if that AP is sitting next to a wall. I don't have a concept of a map on the controller. I have RF distance, okay? If I got a wall between two APs, it's going to put the RF distance of those APs closer together or further apart, depending on what the attenuation was, right? So we're really looking at an X and Y coordinate purely in RF coverage. A lot of times, if I get that cost overlap factor, like I said, 76, 80 percent, threshold, the highest you can go on a threshold right now is 90 percent. And we did that for a very good reason, because some people are going to turn this on right away. What I don't want to do is create coverage holes right away. <laughs> Ever bring your new toy home, it's all shiny, you take it out of the box and find out not only are the batteries dead, but when you put batteries in it, it don't run? <laughs> That'd be breaking a new toy. So, so just, can you clarify, when you said you don't want a coverage hole, what's the definition of a hole? Well, if I, if I decide to make it very, very aggressive and eliminate APs that only have 80% coverage, I could create a 20% uh, portion of a cell that just doesn't have coverage or adequate at, coverage. At what level? At what level? Well, we're looking at everything down to minus 57. So we're being very, very aggressive on the signal. Or minus 60, I think, is the cutoff so on the analysis. Still, so when you say a hole, if you had a place with 62, you would Precisely. consider that a hole. Precisely. But conversely, in a different environment where I've got a minus 70 noise floor, which is entirely possible at 2.4, I'm not going to get any performance out of but, that at But isn't all. that noise floor self-induced? It is, because I've got too many people there, yeah. <laughs> not my noise floor. You, we, that's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> You've seen what clients do when you turn the, uh, the Wi-Fi off, right? They continue to scan. Um, all right, so make room microcell. Jim, the Jim for you. Shoot. So related to this discussion of coverage hole, you said that it was extremely conservative algorithm. How much yes. overlap was required? 90%. 90% or more. At the high setting. At the high. Default comes out at low, and it's 100% coverage. Okay. Okay, and what I've seen so far... This is erroring on the, on, the, on the low side. So it's conservative. I trust it. What I want to do is I want to bring my APs up, not in auto mode, because there's an auto and a manual mode. The auto for the AP allows that XOR to be assigned by the FRA algorithm, which is also disabled when you initialize. Okay? If I turn the algorithm on and I put the APs, which are already in auto, leave them in auto, when it finds at default 100% coverage, it's turning that 2.4 off and turning it into a 5 gigahertz. Okay, so what I'm recommending as far as the best practice on implementing, take the APs out of auto, leave the FRA algorithm on. There's plenty of places that you can see the cost overlap factor. And you should really consider down to about 70% or even down to 60%, but go look at the map. Look at where your AP is at. If it makes sense, great. If you're going to get more aggressive than that, take a fluke or your phone out there and just measure the coverage real quick. What I don't want is somebody flipping that, if, me personally, Flipping that on Friday afternoon at 5 p.m. and going home for the weekend. <laughs> or just overriding the threshold and, you know, I think people could get in, in trouble with that. Go ahead. So, so FRA is a separate automated, uh, automated switch from RRM? Correct. Okay. Correct. That's a new algorithm that's now included. It handles the radio identification. It handles the assignment of radio roles. We can still leave auto or auto RRM on, but turn FRA on. It's completely right. separate. I don't have any of the screenshots for that right now because I'm supposed to show those for the first time Thursday. We should have done this Friday. <laughs> 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 okay, but it is completely separate. I can take the radio out of FRA auto mode, and then I still have auto channel and power on, on the AP. So they're completely separate, even though they're together. So FRA is going to make a decision. On, on what to do with this 2.4 gigahertz interface. Once it decides that that interface is redundant, there's three roles I can put that radio into right now. I can leave it in 2.4, that's role one. 
because we're, con- we're, we're familiar with the concept of an AP mode for a Cisco AP. An AP mode, like monitor mode, affects both interfaces. Now we got to go lower. We got to roll for the uh, slot zero radio. 2.4 is default, 5 gigahertz, and then also, since it's an XOR radio, it's the WISM module. So I have a built in WISM module on a 3800 or 2800. On the I model, <laughs> the antennas, I've got polarity diversity, I've got gain diversity, and that green pointer that's supposed to be good on a high definition screen, that's not doing anything up there, is it? No. Did you All right. Pass around the, uh, the AP? I can. This is actually a good time to do that. The I model. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about running dual 5 gigahertz in a single box, and there's been a lot of naysayers saying that it can't be done or that there's some sacrifice shouldn't be or done. compromise. Shouldn't be done. Shouldn't or be done. Generally bad idea. A lot, of, a lot of folks talking very, very bad about it. You um, know the part where you're <laughs> at a conference and you've done all your math and they told you, you know, so many people were showing up and then twice that number showed up and the room is underpowered and, you know, your options are grab another cable and an AP and run through that crowded room. This does away with all that. Yeah. Okay, so in testing, and we're going to get to some of that, we've done some testing on this. Um, I'm seeing really good performance. I was wondering, are you going to go into any hardware details of what n- are needed to make that happen? Yeah. How do you do the separation? You what we're working on right physical? now. Yeah. Cool. The separation, and it is a critical factor, doing that right uh, makes a difference between things working and not working. Inside that AP, um, there's a lot of metal, okay? When we think about cell overlap, we're usually thinking about some distance from the cell. It's really critical inside of that box. So we had to get the isolation first on the radio deck. And in silicon, we've got a fairly decent separation. It's not as, it's not as good as we'd hoped, uh, but that's the way with silicon. Once you punch the dies, when you find out where you're at. Um, but it's still very good separation. The antenna separation, um, and we're passing around the AP now, there's two so, physical different antennas. So the, the physical, your macro antenna is an actually separate. It's a separate antenna. Yeah. So, and I've got, I've got a graphic up there of this, so I'm getting to it. Um, but the gain diversity is what we're looking at right here, uh, and that's the plots, the micro. Is this antenna with higher gain? The macro is the larger antenna. Um, lower gain, one is, one is vertical, the other is horizontal. I can't remember which is which at the moment. So there's, uh, there's polarity diversity. And then we've got channel diversity, which needs to be in there. The radio itself, which we're passing around right now, physically has two separate antennas. It's got the dual band 2.45 gigahertz antenna, which is what we're operating on when you're a traditional AP. When you switch that AP into five gigahertz, uh, serving five gigahertz, we switch over to the second antennas, which is the microcell antenna. And this one produces a really nice pop plot. I did do a, uh, a survey under that, or actually Wes grabbed one, was it last week for me? Yeah, last week. I didn't put that slide in here yet because that's got to go thirsty too. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> but it looked good. Um, conventional AP footprint, macro cell, uh, uniform 360 degree coverage. All right. Uh, the other thing that we're keeping in mind on right now, the micro cell antenna is forced to the lowest power possible. Okay, so you've got diversity in the silicon, antenna diversity polarization diversity, gain diversity, and then we're going to do power diversity. The microcell is going to be a very low power. Can I take this apart? Can you take that? <laughs> I, believe, I believe that's Wes's career. It's, it's, oh. <laughs> Wes? So no. are you doing any, 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 um, anything in software to move clients between 5 gigahertz radios? Oh, you're going to love the rest of this presentation. <laughs> Am I? Am I? That's why pictures help so much. Okay, why are we doing this? Right? Obviously, you know, you start getting up to where you're, you're looking at utilization 60, 65% in a 5 gigahertz cell. It's getting busy. People are starting to wait, right? If you're doing any real time applications, they're starting to hurt. Theoretically, if I bring up two 5 gigahertz cell with channel diversity, which is what you're seeing right there as well, um, and I can get pretty good isolation between them, I've just created two cells, right? Now you've got clients, and we all know that clients, while they're getting better, um, are not the brightest bulbs in the box sometimes. Anybody can build a network, I like to say. Getting clients to connect to it's a whole different science. Um, so we need some control here. Creating two diverse 5 gigahertz cells gives me a lot more 
in the same footprint. How are we going to manage that? Intercell roaming, and this is all in RRM as well. 802.11v, BSS transition, is the number one method for doing this. And it does work with 802.11v. My threshold for macro, you which is... If you have a client that, has a, that supports... If you have a client <laughs> that supports 802.11v. That's the, that's the problem. Absolutely. Okay, but keep in mind, we're talking about moving towards the future here. And I thought 11v was the greatest idea I ever heard five years five ago years. when we didn't implement it. <laughs> okay, so right now, um, Apple, Samsung, uh, Windows, my... My Windows Surface yeah. Pro 4 supports it in Windows 10. Yeah, it's, it's, so there is getting to be a lot more uh, 802.11v. And on a personal note, I'm really grateful for that because we know a lot about what the client experience is from the network. It'd be great if we could help them out. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, minus 55 dBm. If I'm above minus 55 or at or above minus 55 dBm, then I'm going to send an 11v neighbor message first, transition request message to the client, and I'm going to ask them to move into the microcell with that BSS. There's only going to be one BSS ID in that message, okay? That works. And that's setting the threshold at minus 55 dBm, which keeps me smack dab in the middle. Even if you're a client that has poor antennas, I'm keeping you in that MCS 8, MCS 9 range. Um, for non-11V clients, I've got 802.11k. 11k doesn't help me all that much because that's not going to trigger until I hit, what, minus 70, minus 75, depending on the implementation. And then it's just a suggestion. There's really not, there's, there's not really a lot of good mechanics in there for an unsolicited um, neighbor request, right? Right, right. So I don't, I don't have the ability to tell it that. And then the other way that we could do this, and we're knocking it about, is probe suppression, right? But I get a little nervous about probe suppression. Um, it's done all the time. I know it works, but it's up to the client how they're going to deal with that. Other way, macro to micro. Let's say I get a client that comes up on the micro cell first, and he's below minus 65 dBm, which is where I want that threshold to be. And that's very possible, depending on how the client comes up. You could come up right under the micro cell or what their scan pattern is. What I want to do is I want to get that client out of there because he's eating up more air time than the guys that belong there, right? So I'm going to use the same mechanisms, 802.11v, to transition, 802.11k as a backstop. And right now, this is early in the phase of this. We're, we're talking about implementing and, and doing some testing with probe suppression. But getting the client to move is key. Right now, in certain environments, if all I've got is Apple and Samsung, those are 11v. And pretty much any time I'm doing a conference or high density, we're seeing 50 to 60 percent of those devices being the majority of the network anyway. So I feel pretty good about that in high density environments. Um, schools, places you got a lot more MacBooks, we're going to make a lot more noise about 11v. I think everybody should be doing it. Any questions on that, how we're going to manage it? Did you guys get your coffee this morning? <laughs> Well, we understand that's how you're going to try to manage it. <laughs> We're going to attempt to manage it precisely, okay? This is... <laughs> Until the world catches up. Until the world catches up. Well, 11V shares some pretty good support. Um, one of the things, does it work? Yeah. And pretty much how you'd expect it to. So given what I just described to you, that's just a quick list of test subjects that we did. And then Wes, so just last week you started getting some throughput measurements. Yeah. Okay, so the big question of the day, throughput, micro to micro. You want to explain this one? Yeah, I'll go through. Okay. All right, so we're doing all this stuff, but does it work? Um, I think that's the question, and um, the answer is yes, it does work. Um, and very, very pleased with um, how things are looking. Uh, so this is micro macro uh, efficiency, and the way efficiency is measured basically we run throughput on the individual radios. We can, you know, take the sum of that, and then we uh, we run throughput across both radios simultaneously, and uh, we divide the you know the dual radio versus the sum of the individual, and we have our efficiency. So, efficiency of 50% means that we're just at you know performance of one radio. If we're at 100% efficiency, that means that we're at you know twice the performance of one radio. Um, and so, you know. I, I don't think it's, you know, we're not going to see 100% efficiency, but we're, you know, we're pretty darn close. How many clients are you? Uh, so this is just one client on each radio. Um, you know, this is, this is what I would 
say is probably the toughest case. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're pumping the most packets per second uh, in, the, in this case, and that's, um, you know, you're going to have the highest duty cycle, which you would expect to see the most uh, degradation in this, in this case. Um, and so, you know, uh, showing two channel combinations here. Um, the one on the one on the left is 350 megahertz of separation. The one on the right is channel 149 and channel 128, which is 105 megahertz of separation, um, which is our toughest case. Um, you know, we we have guidance that um, to separate 20 megahertz channels. Uh, yes, these are 20. Um, guidance to keep separation of 100 megahertz between uh, the two radios, and uh, so this is 105 megahertz and you know, still seeing, you know, greater than 90% efficiency in, uh, in both cases. So I, I, these are very promising. It's, um, you know, it's early. We, um, you know, we're still experimenting with uh, certain things, and, um, but I'm, I'm enthusiastic and, and very pleased with how things are looking at, the, at this stage in the game. Yeah, me too. And then we'll, I'll come back and have a macro discussion. We'll talk about have the macro discussion. Have you client load, like lots of clients instead of just one client? Like multiple clients on each radio. Yeah, I, have, I haven't gotten to that yet. This is uh, just the initial uh, initial round of testing. We're we're still the last testing I did before I flew out here this week. You guys know we've got the SEVT running this week also. Last day of testing I did, I went through four images on a controller before the sun went down. So we're still very much yeah. at the tweak and tune stage. Um, we're actively in beta with it right now. But it's been very, very promising. I've, I've seen this radio has not gone through anything that any other radio doesn't go through. And if you've ever been back in the sausage factory when you're making sausage, there's, there's a bunch of little tweaks to come out when you finally get the silicon brought up. Um, so Wes has got the ability. How many clients do you have in that lab? Uh, we probably have 150 set up right now. Yeah. So we'll get to that testing. That's, uh, that's where the rubber meets the road. I want to see it out of his lab before I say, sure. <laughs> oh, oh, question. You're, the, the FRA code and the thought process behind that, yes. would it be possible to retro it back to, say, 3700s and just turn off the 2.4 rather than, since you don't have a 5 gig to switch to, I, use the I same feature? I can't <laughs> directly talk to roadmap items because one floor above me is a man who will get mad. <laughs> 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 but that's an interesting question. <laughs> I would think so. Um, we have to evaluate that. And right now, everybody's hands down going at this, okay? The 3800s, are the, those <coughs> are selling now? What's that? Those are, sell those are shipping now? or those are uh, First shipping, I believe, the end of June. No, no. It's uh, in, in May. In May? Yeah. Oh. Excellent. Sooner than I thought. <laughs> I just out of curiosity, what kind of feedback are you guys getting on the weight and girth of these things? You know, it's better than the 1250. <laughs> 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 there's, there's a lot going on inside of that little box, so, yeah. Have you got any pictures yet of, like, ceiling grids? We recommend hard deck. Hanging and dipping. And <laughs> Since you asked that question, let's hand out the rest of the party favors, and I will hand you an actual working eye model. And we'll do a spoiler word. I'm going to send it around this side. I saw you over there. You were starting to pout. <laughs> I wasn't pouting anything. I was just going to take that we one. Have to, you're going to take that? That one's ugly. <laughs> it doesn't have the pretty name on it. Okay, so let me back up. I kind of gave, you, gave away there. Once we've made a decision to flip that radio into 5 gigahertz, right, what happens, right? What happens if I got clients on that 2.4 gigahertz? Do I just unceremoniously rip the rug out from underneath of them and make yes. my phone ring? You know, that was my go, but <laughs> not, not so there's another new feature in RRM, um, and think of this more like personality for RRM, right? Because we're, we're a manufacturer. You get one set of defaults, <laughs> and one set of defaults doesn't make everybody happy, right? Oh, yeah. RRM um, can be either aggressive or it can take into account, but this is a new command called client network preference, Okay which lets you tell RRM what your preference is. Do you have a preference on connectivity? Don't upset that at all costs, i.e. healthcare, <laughs> right? Or do you have a preference on performance where if I can make a better decision, I should go for that? FRA in all cases defaults to connectivity profile and the connectivity profile says no band or role switching when you've got more than three clients on that AP. 
So by default, if you have three or more clients on it, nothing will happen. Below three clients, and you can change this, below three clients, it will make the transition immediately. All right. Keep in mind that when it makes that transition, you should be in a good position because you've got multiple coverage points around that cell. So you can wait for the radio to be completely unloaded before it switches roles? You can, as a matter of fact. And that's one that I'm waiting on too, <laughs> is actually putting that into that profile. This is the first release of this profile, so 8.2 MR3 will be the first inclination of this. No, but if you're MR, in a lab MR, testing this, huh? MR1. Oh, M MR1, thank you. What did I say? MR3? Yeah. I was thinking 8.1. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Operating same band co-located within radios. And we've done testing against other manufacturers that put two 5 gigahertz radios in there. If it's done very well and you have the isolation, right, we still saw probably a 5% degradation at the top end because of that co-located radio. But at that point in time, you're maxing out those radios. So that's, that's where we're likely to see some degradation. And that seems to be consistent with the testing we've done so far. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with the results we've gotten. External models. Now the external model, I just passed it around to you. There is one set of antennas on that external model. So if you have an E-series AP and you don't have a dark connector to give you a second set of antennas, the 2.4 gigahertz radio is fairly limited. It can monitor at 2.4, but we're not even letting it do that. It's a traditional AP, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. The idea on the external antenna AP is we can actually extend that diversity now at the end of the cable plants, right? And I did some, some mock-ups and Wes did some testing on macro macro so far just to make sure that our assumptions are correct. <clears throat> but if I take a pair of 2566 D4Ms, and I didn't look at the spec right before I came in here, I think I'm somewhere between 13 to 17 dB front to back ratio on those two APs. I want to say it's 17. But I did a mock-up real quickly of two of those back-to-back -back in Echahow, which now supports the multiple interfaces. And what I found... Well, see, that was a beautiful picture on my slide <laughs> <laughs> of big green lobes. I'm not sure what I did with that. At any rate, the measurements are correct. I, I had minus 57 at 120 feet by 55 feet, so total of about 6.6 .6 or almost 7K of coverage at minus 57 from two diverse channels on the end of one cable, which thrills me. I take a look to draw the picture. Ekahal drew it so much prettier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Jim, just stick to circles. I'm going to do that, yeah. Do you need a, do you need a, a cup? Back-to-back <laughs> 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 -back antennas covering opposite sides. And we do this all the time, too. I mean, I get in convention centers, the Gillaroos and the, the trout antennas. We'll move them a meter apart, back to back. I've even had them when you, you can't get that space, just back to back, maybe two, three feet apart. And the performance is phenomenal. Those things do not hear what's behind them. And if you put both of their backs behind them, they do a great job of getting everything out in front. Um, they're also very tight antennas. So this is exactly what I'm looking at. At 10 feet, to be able to get 6,000 square foot coverage with density, that's pretty decent. So that I'm really excited about. Plus, I get better separation between the antennas, right? Um, and I can run both of them at 11 to 14. I don't have the same power limitations I did with a micro macro now because I'm creating two separate cells, and I'm still only running one cable. Can you run back to the slide before this? I want to see some. Okay. Yep. You're showing that the. Um it confused me because I'm seeing the Omni connected with the antenna connected. Yeah, that's what Fred had for the picture. I mean, we've all kind of been <laughs> churning slides to get here to SEVT because we uh, we did, when was it, Lauren? It was uh, a while ago we did the EN internal field update, and the questions just poured right after that. <laughs> so, uh, and we were like, it should be great. I'm still working on bringing mine up on the <laughs> controller, and that was revision like three of the code. So it was an interesting Christmas. Um, Macro macro testing. All right, so macro macro. Um, this is with the uh, 2566P antennas, which is the you know 60 degree antenna, and um, you know seeing sim very similar, actually uh, you know even better results than uh, with the uh, micro macro. 
And uh, you know, we, we tried different combinations um, in terms of you know, antenna orientation and spacing. And you know, we, we see pretty consistent results. Um, you know, so we've, we're feeling very confident um, in both micro macro and macro macro. Um, you know, working as, you know, as advertised. <coughs> you know, if you think what we're trying to achieve here, which is to, uh, you know, just gain additional capacity um, because, you know, you're, you don't have any, you're basically wasting your radio anyway, um, in some cases with, with a 2.4 radio. Um, so, you know, my kind of thought is if you're, you're, if you're above 75% efficiency, um, you know, you're having a, you know, beneficial, you know, you're extremely beneficial, right? You, you've added capacity to your network. Um, and uh, you know we're even higher than that, so I'm 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 thrilled, and we're certainly going to continue testing and um, you know do more advanced tests like uh, you know the multi-client. Yeah. And this testing is with the three meters between the back-to-back -back AP uh, antennas. No, these I think antennas you were pointed straight down, weren't you? These antennas uh, were oh. separated by four feet, I think. Four feet. Yeah, they're just on you know opposite sides of the AP. Okay. Yep. So this is this is high density. All right, and, and the angles you put those antennas at are going to affect your roaming. But in testing like that, you're looking at a room somewhat like this with a lot more people in it. Right. Yeah, I'm usually not... one thing, roaming is another, right? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. All I'm concerned about is load balancing at that point in time. There isn't yeah. going to be any roaming this, in there. This use case is, you know, is two cells, same coverage. Worst case. Yep. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Oh, one other point I wanted to make is uh, some so interesting observations. Um, you have, uh, depending on your client spacing, you'll see uh, client interference with each other. Um, so that's yeah, in the dual cell. Yeah, so that's one thing to be uh, you know to be aware of. If you know if you have two laptops you know right next to each other and they're both transmitting uplink, you know you're going to have um, you know degradation in that case. Um, so the cl the client spacing becomes important. Um, but I think in kind of a real deployment, it's not going to be that noticeable. Actually, can you can you go a little bit more into that again? Because uh, I have environments where, in high density, a lot of people will be close. Yep. Close That's actually better than his lab where there are no people. That's in true. in a in a high density environment, the client the client interference, um, and this was one of the assumptions back early when we started with high density was, well, geez, I mean those clients have got to be shouting at each other. But you put a few water bags in between those clients, and they've got lower sensitivity anyway. It becomes less of a problem in a full room. Actually, your problem in the full room is getting your signal through those people, which is why I'm a huge fan of line of sight um, in those environments. Question, though. <laughs> if I was doing that and I'm having that client client interference, mm -hmm. is, if I had two APs, I'd be in the same boat, though. Yes, you would be. Yeah, this is, there's no magic there. <laughs> <laughs> now, we just, I've finally gotten the Gilaru antennas, which I'd been doing 3,000 square foot cells on. We finally broke down for uh, Cisco Live in Berlin and went to 1,500 square foot cells, which was basically the same thing, double covering the same, same footprint. And we got really good results. We cranked the data rates up. We adjusted uh, optimized roaming. And uh, when they first filled the room, I had like 172 on one of my five gigs. And three of them around it were at like 30 or 40, but like five, six minutes into it. They were all coming up at 70s and 80s all around. And I was like, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, how do you test a high-density room? Invite your friends over and see if it works. <laughs> so if you've got an external antenna, you're talking about an AP that can pick, uh, that can change modes from, you know, 5 gigahertz to 2.4 gigahertz. What happens if you only have a 5 gigahertz antenna attached? Oh, if you're using single band, then you want to be in manual mode. You don't want to leave this for FRI. Actually, this is the external model. This is going to be a manual assignment. FRA or the the no, redundant we'll, radio? We'll do we'll do FRA right for. Um, <laughs> we will if it's in two point four gigahertz, right? So if and he was asking a question based on five single gigahertz. band, yeah. right? Five gigahertz single band. So FRA, we're only doing redundant radio identification at two point four gigahertz. We haven't extended that to five gigahertz yet, um, and that's primarily because we just don't really have that big a problem at five gigahertz. Um, you can get there with 80 megahertz and 160 megahertz channels, but. All of Fred's pictures didn't show up, and he made some really good ones, too. <laughs> okay, dark connector, we're passing one of those around as well. On the dark connector, mention the smart antennas. I've got data lines for each one of these antennas, 
as well as an RF path. That has a RPTNC reverse. Yeah, RPTNC adapter on it, and it fits pretty much to every antenna I've got for the 37 and 38s right now. So we're in great shape there. Operation guidelines. This is Fred's words. You guys know Fred Niehaus, right? Some of them do. He said it so well, I thought I'd just poach his slide. With the dark connector, you have the ability to operate 2.4 or 5 gigahertz. Recommending dual band antennas, of course, but you can use single band antennas if you've got them. Now you want to be in manual mode, right? Um, separation, separation's always good. I have had to put antennas close together. I don't like putting antennas close together. Um, all of our antennas have the ground plane built into the back of them, our externals, the, the uh, 2566s and the 2513 right now. So if you, get, if you get those antennas off the plane from each other, the more separation, the happier you're going to be. But you can put them in fairly close proximity, and I've had good results with that. Wait a minute. There we go. And then we've got the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So let's say you just don't need the 5 gigahertz coverage. Basically, I've got the WISM module built in right now, which gives me enhanced location. It gives me better WIPS coverage because I'm scanning continuously. And in the WISM module right now, we scan serially all 2.4 and 5 gigahertz channels. So if we do a full channel load, I'm getting about a 1,200 millisecond dwell on each one of those channels as I go through, and I'm producing information pretty fast. Um, so there's a big boon. There's always a big boon in my mind of having more APs that are listening and feeding my, my algorithms for what we need to do next. I also off-slip all of my neighbor messaging and everything else off to that. So as far as receiving neighbor messages or making evaluations, all those dwells are included. It's also one of those things that uh, is probably my favorite use case because I just saw it. We were in New Frontier, and of course we're doing live broadcasting out of there over WebEx. And what's everybody in that room doing? They're bringing up the WebEx and they're taking real-time video to their laptop. So my dynamics in that room are no longer we're just checking email. It becomes very critical, and there's a uh, there's a challenge in that room. I'm going to be engaged in this afternoon. So. <laughs> This, on the other hand, though, it happens all the time. When you start taking a look at, you know, talking to folks over telepresence or anything like that, you get into that room with the big wired telepresence unit, and nine times out of ten, if somebody's jacked in on WebEx, they all pop open their own devices and watch the video there as well. So it's very easy to take a look at a conference room that normally holds 20 people and suddenly have a serious bandwidth demand that, that's a latency-specific application. You can bring up a micro cell in there, and it does work. So, at least so far. That's all I had for slideware. Questions? Yeah, on the, you, know, you talk about having it when you're doing dynamic bandwidth selection and things like that, having that protection mechanism in there so that you don't you know, hurt yourself too badly. Because we always tend to say that most vendors are smart enough to give you the rope, tie the noose, mm -hmm. but also put the chair under your feet. Right. If I put these things into manual mode, can I get it to the point where you no longer give me the chair anymore, and can I do dumb things like dual 160s and really cause problems onto my network? You sure can. <laughs> Is there a reason why you wouldn't Because you would up? never write me an email to complain about that, but I, I do get those emails. <laughs> yes, okay, I may have lobbed that one out to you. <laughs> one couple of things, and that's a very important point. In software right now, I cannot place those two antennas within 100 megahertz of each other. That's enforced by software. In micro macro mode, I have no control over the power of that micro antenna. I mean, I have no knobs that I can turn for that. That is one of my friction points with engineering right now, because I do think it's possible we may want a little more power there at some point. It's, it's fixed at one milliwatt? It is fixed at the lowest the radio will go. 2 dBm. Keep in mind, it's four, four radios in there. So if we take a look at TPO, uh, we're getting, what, two, 2 dBm right now is the minimum power. Seems to be sufficient. I think on the macro side, on the macro cell, you've still got TPC control over that, and I would actually recommend less power rather than more power, particularly, but you know, it all comes down to what your environment is requiring. Um, I don't see this as being the I model. I don't see that for a high ceiling environment or anything. I, that's straight down the middle of the road uh, enterprise. 
Can you do micro macro with the external model? Yes, you can. You're going to need to be real careful there because your antenna check selections and choices and configuration, I can give you the, the configs, but you getting it right is going to be up to you. So there is good manual control. <laughs> if you let the system do what it does, FRA is very conservative. You may not get as many 5 gigahertz interfaces <coughs> as you wanted. At the very least, if I go to monitor APs, and that's the other thing that we got done in this code, dual band radios used to show up under their own dual band interface. Now we're doing live, you know, 5 gigahertz and 2 points. So that's all been transported up. If you do show 802.11a radios and you've got a dual 5 gigahertz radio sitting there, you will see both slot 1 and slot 0 with all of its information, channels, and power laid out in front of you. So it's very easy to evaluate. Monitor dual band radios gives you all the cost factors. So I can pull a list. And I can actually search now on radio roll, which is that XOR's roll, whether it's serving or not. Um, and I can pull up a list of cost factors and do what I as an administrator would do instead of walking a site survey, walk out and look at the ones it picked and says they're too covered, double check it and let them go. Make them into five gigahertz radios or monitor mode radios. FRA's priorities, and then I'll answer your question. Always gonna be five gigahertz first, looking for more throughput. If DCA comes back and says, <laughs> you're already running 160 megahertz channels, I could do it, but it's not a real good fit, it's going to flip it over to monitor mode. It's also going to do that if you continue to add radios and it becomes one of the 5 gigahertz radios that is, that is too redundant. But in the output, I will see the suggested role as either being 2.4, 5 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz monitor or monitor. So it actually does decide based on that ex AP's experience, what's the best role? Sam? The past several generation of APs have all shared the same mounting bracket, which is really nice when you have to go pop an AP off and put it back on. Yes. That seems to look different than the bottom of the same, mounting of same, same mounting bracket. Same mounting bracket. Same mounting bracket. Same mounting bracket. Okay. Yeah. We hit you for 30 watts of power. We're not going to mess up your mounting bracket, too. <laughs> 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 all right. Jim, yeah, I have one question. Shoot. On the radio isolation, can you go into a little bit more depth on what is implemented on the silicon side, like bandpass filtering or anything like that between? Bandpass filtering, echo sorb, gaskets, that's probably been the, the, when you bring up a brand new AP, you can predict where RF is going to go. You guys do RF in real life. What happens when you squeeze a bag of water? It comes out somewhere. Right. <laughs> yeah, and specifically with bandpass filtering, like um, for the people that may not uh, on the video may not be yeah. that familiar with hardware, like with the hundred megahertz channel separation. Yep. Uh, how that factors in with the like the bandpass filtering that's implemented in the AP to isolate those radios. Tunable on the front end right now. Are we doing it all in the PA? You live closer to those. You want to answer this? Uh, yeah. Sure. Speculate. <laughs> so, the majority of the isolation. Um, comes from the uh, antenna polarity um, and uh, you know cable routing, and then in the silicon, there's we're not we're not strictly filtering, um, you know. No, it's a versatile radio. Yeah, you know, we're not strictly filtering out. Say, you know, radios configured for Uni three. We're not filtering out Uni one. Um, we're You're not doing any circuit switch bandpass filtering or no, anything no. like that. Okay. No. No. Nope. Typical radio, but on the isolation of the radios. I know when we were talking about this initially, they were looking for 10 or 13, 10 to 13 dB isolation in the silicon, which is, uh, that sounds about right to me. At any rate, the truth is in the, uh, is in the throughput, and uh, Wes just got started with throughput measurements. Yeah. You have plans to do any other performance metrics like uh, retransmissions, near far, radio testing, things like that? Yeah. Because I'd like to see more than just throughput, ideally. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at things like, um, you know, retries. Do you, you know, when you're transmitting on both radios, um, you know, do you see more retries? Do you see, um, you know, missed acts or things like that? Uh, and, uh, you know, so far we're not really seeing, you know, we don't see higher retries. We, you know, we're not seeing things like that. Uh, okay. And then are you see, hearing, or like I know with one of the um, previous generation APs, you had the module and you were doing some transmission scheduling. Yep. So that was, uh, yeah, that was with the Christmas sale or the AC module yep. for the 3600. Are you doing any transmission scheduling between no. the two radios or anything? Okay. No, no. it's two, two separate BSSIDs. Um, you know, it's, each radio is on its own device, you know, to do, to do what it wants. Now, right now, each radio gets the same SSID. So if you got them assigned to one, you've got them assigned to the other. That's the way the code's being released. But 
I've, I've already echoed, I could see. And one of the use cases, actually Fred came up with, it was a really good one too. When we start opening up Uni2 channels, because that's on the table right now, um, I don't know how many of you were around when we opened up Uni2 initially, or the Uni2e. The concern was you can't use them because the clients are so far behind, right? This is a perfect environment. If I could do two separate SSIDs, I could keep, I could put a profile down on one to keep it out of those new extended Uni2s and not create a coverage hole. I could have dual coverage within a cell to uh, take care of all the clients and start getting metrics on how far I've got to go, right? So it opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. I was, uh, it's aggressive. I was nervous about it. I'd heard the same things. Um, two radios and two radios together in the same package does not intuitively seem like a good idea, but it can be done if it's if the details are attended to. Um, and we're going to test it. So hopefully by uh, I would think by Cisco Live anyway, we're going to have yeah. quite a bit more information on this. There's yeah. no support on that one for the. I didn't see a slot for the hyperlocation module. There's no support in... in there is. The that was actually in one of the invisible pictures back here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. And actually, it's going to be better. Where's the eye model right now? Here it is. So the, uh, the hyperlocation module itself on this side, it's going to be a side mount. So okay. this, uh, this, and don't, right upstairs is Mark Denny. Don't say how big it is. He gets very sensitive about that. <laughs> So it's going to be a side module mount right on the side of this, um, and it doesn't add a tremendous amount of weight, but it actually does make the antennas for the hyperlocation module more accessible to me um, and clears it outside of... Does that affect the dark connection? No. Dark connector is on this side. Oh, I thought it was yeah. on the other side. But if you do a module and you do a dark connector and you have dual external antennas... Um, busy AP. It's kind of huh? ugly at that Busy point. AP. God, don't say ugly. Like now Voltron, you sound man. like the aesthetic you police, you know? <laughs> That's why I said it. <laughs> I know. You know how I feel about that. You sit in that meeting and they're like, it's so ugly. It's like, look, did I take a look at your kid's picture and call it ugly? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use that still with, a, with a sidecar on it, it's still going to be smaller than today's 3700 plus Halo. Yes. Which is, which yeah. is, oh, is, yeah. Halo. Yeah. Which, is a significant <laughs> which is getting to be, package, right? it's a significant package. Yeah. Look, we're shoving BLE in these things. We're shoving multiple uh, radios in them. We've, got, we've still got the modularity where we can go with, with uh, small cell. Um, we're using our radios for a lot more these days. So if, uh, if you think 30 watts is a lot of power, that's probably the limit of what we can actually Well, that's that was the next question is once you stack all that stuff on there, yeah. power-wise, is that 30 watts still going to handle it? or um, Likely going to need... No, no, no. So external connector on there for an no, so the, uh, power supply. Yeah, this attachment. is... The, the, the AP itself needs yeah. like 22 watts um, okay. thereabouts uh, without anything connected. Um, plug in a module, will still be under uh, AT power. And uh, you know, if you start doing things like USB, powering over USB, um, that's when we might exceed AT. Um, so this will support UPoE. Well, and this is, this is pre-release because the module hasn't actually come through all of the testing yet. So we've been telling people to expect UPoE power as a possibility yeah. um, you know, for the side module. But again, you're supporting multiple use cases in a coordinated fashion, which... You can plug <coughs> AC or DC power in there, though? Or is it PoE only? DC. Um, yeah, there's an external adapter. It's 48 volts. So the the uh, 2K only has PoE. Yeah. Okay. But the 3K has DC. Okay. Yeah. But does the 2K support hyperlocation? Does it support that sidecar? No. Okay. So then does not. I see where that's going. All right. Um, well, let's talk about some use cases for this then. And I just saw this, and I expect you guys are seeing it too. When you build a good Wi-Fi network, people begin to expect it to be there. And what we found on repeating events is year over year, I get more people that show up ready to use it. Um, so we've kind of peaked after four or five years over in Barcelona. We're, we're starting to peak on our capacity numbers. Uh, everybody freaked out this year because we hit like 33,000 concurrent connections on 500 and something APs last year. And this year it came in just shallow that, somewhere around 32,000. And everybody freaked out, and they were like, where, where did our peak concurrent connections go? Well, we also saw AC clients go from 25% to 53% this year. I saw the overall duty cycle in 5 gigahertz drop from 65% average to about 35 to 40%. And we saw throughput, the actual consumed amount of data, go up by 30%. Better clients getting on and off. Better the clients getting on and off the network first, right? 
And what's peak concurrent clients? That's your funnel. That's your funnel. That's the queue waiting to get on and off the air, right? If I'm doing, if I got a bigger hole in the bottom of the funnel, I'm not going to hit those same concurrent client levels because we had the same number of MAC addresses there. In fact, that actually went up. But I saw firsthand this year the efficiency that the AC clients are bringing into the environment. And it was impressive for a 25% increase. I saw every bit of a 30% decrease in channel utilization and a 30% increase in throughput. So do I, do I think there's a market for a dual five gigahertz interface? Do I think that uh, we need to start thinking about our infrastructures in terms of what people are gonna be consuming? Yeah, <coughs> I do. Do I need it all today? No, thank God. I don't want to go back to the 802.11n days where we were barely keeping pace with demand and every time we released a new technology, about 1% before it blew up. <laughs> so AC is making a huge difference. It gives us that growth curve in our networks that we don't have to right. keep hitting that barrier. The sense, the sense of urgency goes down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if I've got headroom in my network, I always sleep a little better at night. I think the next thing is translating that into NMS with Cisco Prime and being able to trend on yeah. on your growth, extra capacity that you have to know when you need to potentially start upgrading, adding additional capacity. DNA. I know it sounds like three letters and a lot of people are talking <laughs> about it, but you know what I've been saying for years too. The only difference between your car that drives from the desert floor all the way to the top of the uh, mountain was... 20 years ago, you didn't have sensors in that car and a computer running it, so you had to stop three times to retune the carburetor, right? We've got the sensors now. We're actually starting to collect the data, and uh, you saw the cloud demo. There's a lot more coming on that. I see automating this and, unfortunately, taking a lot of the things that we do, you know, in a niche market and making them simple. But the good news is there'll be more technology. <laughs> how long before prime infrastructure catches up specifically around telling us how many uh, FRA changes were made and what they were made to? Uh, I can't comment on that yet. Yeah. It seems to me like that'd be really important as, it would be. as you're running a network, right? I can tell you, I've been running 3.1. In fact, we ran 3.0 uh, for Mobile World Congress. I'm thrilled with what they've done with Ekahau import and export. Uh, is coming on 3.1. They just went through and revamped all of that because it, it makes me crazy when I draw antennas and have model numbers and angles and everything else and we import it and they just show me APs on a map. It's, well, there was a lot more detail. <laughs> so that, that's been fixed. Um, and then some of the reports that I'm getting now, I can, keep, uh, I can keep tally of clients and I did it at Mobile World Client uh, Congress. I can keep count of uh, clients on the AP in three minute rolling increments. Um, channel utilization. So it's getting a lot more granular, and that's the kind of information that we need um, to drive some of these changes and be able to give, give productive feedback. But having a radio that can change roles, that's an excellent tool to have at the end of that decision chain. Modeling so, that, I think, is going to be a little bit of an interesting challenge to see how, how the software providers come up with, you know, how do you model a, a, a you know, situation A and situation B. Here's, right. Here's what your network looks like, and if it gets heavy, here's you know here's the addendum right. to that. Right. Um, so that's yeah. gonna be interesting. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uncharted ground right now. Right now we're focused on getting this out there and making it work with the with the prescribed use cases, but the number of use cases that are coming up and the things that we could do because we know what we're doing, um, or we have the metrics on it, um, it's there's a lot of options. Um, so it's some. I'm very, very happy that we're producing the AP, and what I've seen of it so far, it's working. I came this shy of putting them into the SEVT. Um, that was a notion back in November, was go with, and, and well, you know me. How, how agreeable are you guys to a brand new product that isn't even through beta testing yet, putting the whole show on it? I shy away from things like that. It doesn't feel like a good career choice. <laughs> but I will say it would have made it. Um, we just we pulled the plug on that probably a month ago because I just had no guarantees that testing or software was going to be there and we didn't have a fallback plan. Uh, we were going to reuse the infrastructure for it. But as of last week's testing, Wes called me, what was it, Wednesday? Thursday. Thursday. He says, I got great numbers. And I was like, well, that's really good news. <laughs> but, you know, it just took a little, a little software change and uh, things are coming along pretty nicely. Uh, one last question. I'm not sure if I missed it or not. There's been a lot of information, so thank you. But how does DBS play in with the flexible radio assignment? Um, are there certain channel width restrictions? Yes. Okay. Yes. As a matter of fact, okay, let me touch on that. You will get a GUI warning. You will get a CLI warning. 
If you try to put those two radios too close together, you are not able to do that. It will come up, it'll block it, won't take the command, and it'll say, here's the channels you can use. Okay? DBS, same exact thing. No problem at all. I've been running it in DBS at home uh, almost consistently, and it still honors that. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of DBS. Um, so, so both radios could operate at 40 megahertz, 80 megahertz, depending on if they're just separated. far enough separated apart? Separated apart. And that's, that's some of the things we're just starting to get into doing the delving and testing like that, because that brings in a lot of combinations. Are we looking at 100 megahertz from the two primary channels, and one's plus and one's minus, and now we got 80 megahertz? So there's a lot of combinations to test on that, and you kind of got to let this run through. We did also, no, I won't say that here. But is that? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the camera's off. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and on that, on, on, on that, on that selection, is that is that part of it right now? Is that part of the, the FRA? I mean, or is that just determined? What DBS? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, DBS is its own algorithm, and I I like that algorithm. Here's the problem with DBS: you put in an 80 megahertz capable AP or 160 megahertz capable AP, and out on the 19th hole, somebody says, "We're running." 380 megahertz wide channels, right? <laughs> There's, there, there is satisfaction at looking at it saying, yeah, we got 80 megahertz running everywhere. There's absolutely, you guys are radio guys, I'm a radio guy. It's like, was that a good idea and did you need to do that? Because <laughs> I think spectrum is precious. I've, I've run out of it at the worst of times. Uh, so I tend, to, I tend to watch that. But DBS has been very good. I mean, I've had I've had plenty of performance, um, you know, arguably I'm only running eight or ten devices at my house, um, and the kids only moved out. Only eight or ten? That's just me and my wife. <laughs> only eight. The dog has no thumbs, dog has no thumbs, and the grandbabies aren't old enough yet. Aren't you on the IoT, man? <laughs> <laughs> That's a 2.4 gigahertz band. Oh, true. <laughs> no DBS there. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, are you... Um, is Cisco going to be planning to do any um, any customer education on on where best practices? Because I can yes. see this even at 20 megahertz eating up five yep. gigahertz spectrum. If you're like if, if somebody says I want to put 3800s in my entire building and they're all going to be five gigahertz. Right. You know. So if Devin put it in, they all be five <laughs> gigahertz. Right. Right. But you're eating up. You know. I, I, 20 megahertz. So I've seen that. I'm uh, like you guys. I get calls and people say, Well, we did this. And now nothing works. Well, don't do that. <laughs> Let's do this. What, back, back when you had a goal, what was that? Let's work on that, okay? <laughs> and then, you know, kind of explain it. Most, most sins or errors that I see now is everybody's gotten the high-density thing, and everybody I talk to immediately tells me they're a high-density client environment. Mm -hmm. This room right here is a high-density client environment. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, it isn't. No, no it's no. not. <laughs> no. 200 people actively using my AP within its circumference of self, that's a high client density environment and that's a problem to manage. So, yeah, we're doing a lot more public education. I just finished an RRM update guide um, that I think most of you probably saw here the last couple of days. There will be an update for FRA. It's already written. It went out with the beta form. Um, so that's what I'm working on next week. There's going to be more customer education. And what this. channel width do these come out of the box when you bring, you bring them up? When they come out of the box, they come out of the box at 20 megahertz. Yes. yes. Channel 36. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Just Back in the seven got six, did that scare you when it came up in 80 megahertz? Yeah, I immediately <laughs> called the developers, and I was like, no, that's a party foul. <laughs> <laughs> I wish every vendor did that. Yeah, yeah, I know. So hopefully, hopefully we're, we're, everybody's listening up here. So thanks a lot for you guys' support, and you know, it's going to be an interesting year.